Welcome to Marge Mill, a Grade 2 listed historic building. Marsh Mill was built in 1794 by Ralph Slater. The mill was used to grind various grades of flour, but as requirements changed over time, it went over to grinding meal for farm use. From 1928 to the 1930s, the mill was used as a cafe and then restored externally in 1965. Wyaborough Council became the owner of the mill in 1974 and a few years later considered converting the house for community use and the mill into a museum. In 1979 it was decided to demolish the house and reconstruct the drying kiln in its former location. Also considered at that time was the idea of using the mill as a tourist destination containing a museum and a craft centre. The creation of the craft village alongside the mill was approved in 1988 and this involved the building of craft shops, private dwellings, two village squares and a village inn known today as the Tavern at the Mill. By 1989, a new cap and fan staging was in position, and in 1990, on the 16th of January, the sales turned for the first time in 60 years.
Welcome to the Kiln House Gallery, or as I like to call it, the Forgotten Space. Turn right once you have pulled up the heavy glass sliding doors to Marsh Mill and you see a wooden door propped open to a small area saying Gallery. Take a couple of steps forward and from the small balcony you are immediately confronted by several steep stone steps that take you into what seems like a dungeon. There you will see a long low down table against the wall, a huge white painted chimney and hopefully a smiling face sitting at a chair. That is me, Anne Charlesworth, and I have been sitting in this space now for over two years and have given myself the responsibility of bringing in artists and their work into this small space. Just like the TARDIS from Doctor Who, this space is deceptive in size. The central chimney means that you can walk around the four sides of the room. Estate agents would call it bijou or intimate, quirky or challenging. For me though, it has become a second home and I call it an art gallery with capital letters. This gallery has an obvious symbiotic relationship with the mill, as without the mill there would be no gallery. However, whilst it doesn't have the prowess of Marsh Mill's historical roots, its heritage, working machinery and social history, the gallery is nonetheless just as important. It is like the silent relative who has a voice, it's just that nobody takes the time to listen. Being the curator and artist in residence for the gallery, I have championed its survival, having breathed life back into a neglected and forgotten space, and have kept a rolling programme of interesting and diverse art here. I manage it without any support or funds, and I am extremely committed to and passionate about it. The gallery, I feel, has two major roles, as a community space and as an artist gallery. It is increasingly difficult to find spaces where local groups or schools can exhibit their work without some kind of hierarchy and vetting process or where large amounts of money are concerned. I want to retain this community spirit. Being the go-between, in effect the face of the gallery, I am able to be the initiator of ideas and the communicator, overseeing community projects and helping build relationships between businesses, schools, parents and artists. Its second role is that of the artist's gallery. Being a practising artist and having a master's degree in fine art, I understand the needs of artists and have numerous links and contacts to colleagues and art establishments. The Kiln House Gallery provides a much needed and unique space that artists' work can be exhibited. As curator, I try to approach artists that would not normally approach main commercial galleries and help them to fulfil their dreams of a solo show, being responsible for their publicity, organising them, hanging their work and invigilating it, fielding questions and again being the representative for the gallery. Even though the exhibitions change, I have been a constant providing continuity, a friendly contact and a smile. My aim is to keep the Kiln House Gallery and Marsh Mill alive and kicking, a place where people can see art blended with history, heritage, education, but ultimately providing a real sense of community, a place for the people and the people for the place, a friendly and thriving establishment full of creativity, events, workshops, support and opportunities. As yet the council haven't recognised it as such, but my aim is for them to see its worth not only to the people of Thornton, but further afield. At present, the exhibition which runs until Sunday the 11th of May is from Peter Clark, a local artist who I met through another community art event that I organised. I encouraged him to put his work forward for his first public solo exhibition here in the gallery. He works on celebrity portraits using graphite pencil. His work is extremely time consuming but he loves it and often stays up for hours in the zone of creativity. Unfortunately the mill had to close for the first time over the winter period but prior to that I had Alan Hope's watercolours of Mediterranean and exotic scenes which visitors loved and Sandra Cardin, a photographer from Manchester who was visiting the mill and stumbled across the gallery. After several encouraging emails I finally managed to persuade her to do her first ever photographic exhibition and supported her through the process. Not, on, not only did the exhibition prove a few success, she also managed to sell several pieces of her wo work. She has now gone on to exhibit with confidence and sell around the North West. I have also tried to bring a diverse range of work into the gallery dis despite the restrictions of the Grade 2 star listing, but have managed to bring work that not only does the pub general public find interesting, but also able to inspire other artists to create more art. The world would be a very dull place without art, artists and someone to enjoy the artworks. I hope I have managed to whet your appetite a little into the world of art. You can of course visit the small website for the gallery at thekilnhousegalleryupdated.blogspot.com 
or email me if you have any questions about art exhibiting or just to say hi at anlc at bluebottle.com. Thank you for listening and looking in the gallery. Take care and... first and second stories are the drying and storage floors. These large rooms were used for storing grain before milling and flour waiting collection. The drying kiln, where grain was dried before milling, was originally covered with specially perforated tiles which allowed hot air to pass through the grain, which was sped e spread evenly on the floor. It is now known as the Kiln Gallery and contains a commemorative plaque which reads This plaque is in recognition of the dedicated work of Mr. Walter Heapy, Mr. Windmill, towards the preservation and restoration of Mark Mill.
On the fourth story is the great spur wheel, set between two pairs of fixed beams. This wheel carries 132 square wooden cogs. These mesh with four stone nuts, each of which varies in diameter and number of cogs, to drive the stones at their own particular speed for each grade of flour and meal. The stones are the true heart of the mill and are the reason all this machinery exists, to enable the stones to grind the corn. They are arranged in pairs with a runner stones above a bed stone and are four feet in diameter. The most efficient speed of rotation was 125 revolutions per minute. They were from millstone grit, a hard sandstone from Derbyshire. The working surfaces were carefully prepared by skilled stone dressers. The first essential was a smooth surface slightly dished towards the centre. Before the runner stone was placed in position, the bearings on the spindle were carefully adjusted to allow the stone to rotate in a perfectly horizontal plane. The clearance between the two stones also required extremely subtle adjustments to produce the desired texture of meal. This, clear, this clearance varied between 1 16th and 3 30 seconds of an inch, depending on the grade of flour or it could be set to a quarter of an inch for crushing animal meal which contained components the size of peas. The bedstone was wedged up from below and was balanced by weights. Care had to be taken because friction between the two stones could fire the mill. There are four oblong shapes. Here there would have been hopper bins which would have been kept supplied with appropriate grades of grain by the miller's boy. The sack hoist received its power from the floor below from a belt and pulling device.
On the top floor of the mill, over 70 feet above the ground, is the engine room. Everything here revolves in a horizontal plane, like a gun turret. This action is called luffing. Before the fantail was invented in 1745, bringing the mill head to wind was done by a hand crank. This was a difficult task, and if there was a sudden wind change, the cap, sails and everything else could be blown off. The sails are the first link in the chain of operations. Each sail consists of a whip or radius, 30 feet long, and fastened at right angles to the wind shaft. The whips are pierced at one seventh of their length from the wind shaft with a series of holes into which the crossbars are fitted. The varying angle of these crossbars give the sail its pitch or angle of weather. The second link in the chain of events is the wind shaft, which brings the rotary power of the sails to the mill itself. Originally, this was made of oak wood. Now it is a hollow iron shaft. The shaft is tilted back to throw some of the weight of the sails on the rear thrust bearing and so distribute the weight evenly to the tower walls. This also allows clearance of the lower parts of the tower. The third link is the brake wheel. This is the most dominant feature in the cap. The brake was controlled from the third storey gallery by the miller. If the mill ran away in a storm, it could not be stopped by the brake for fear of causing a fire by friction. In such an event, the miller quartered the sails by turning them edgewise to the wind and then choking the stones with grain until they slowed down the whole mill. The fourth link is the wallower. This is meshed constantly with the brake wheel and is used to convert the near horizontal rotary motion of the sails to a vertical rotary motion. On the fifth storey of the mill is the grain store. The room is empty except for the sack hoist at the foot of the stairs. The trap door could be seen through which the grain was hoisted in sacks from the first two floors. into the loft and the sail. So please, as it were, make your own warm. If you could give a good, a good windmill welcome for our duo singing for us. They are actually part, half of, of a group called Part 4, but they like to be known as me and Mrs. Jones. It's Alan Roger. Thank, Thank you. you. Come fly with me, let's float down to the moon. 
And let me play amongst the stars Let me see what spring is like on Jupiter and Mars In other words, hold my hand In other words, be Farmers Market on the second Saturday of the 